if we think of Eliot's question of why do people hurt themselves, yeah. I think it has to be why do people keep hurting themselves. It starts off as a particular solution at a particular moment to the threat or the experience of feeling helpless. Maybe some examples of what might cause a self-harming approach from the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if it's very early on. For example, a child cries when it's hungry, and the mother usually even begins to lactate as soon as she hears the cry, and she's there. She'll wake up as soon as the first cry, and she'll be there. For most mothers and children, that's the relationship. For some mothers and children, the child cries and the mother doesn't respond. And then the mother gets angry. The kid keeps waking me up in the middle of the night. She doesn't want to get up. It has to yell and scream, so mama will come. The child has to be sick for mama to come. The child has to bang his head against the wall, so mama comes. So then the connection is made between pain and attachment. The expectation gets built up that the connection to my mother is forged through my distress, my pain, and her anger. And you can see how that's a substrate that would underpin something like sadomasochism as it f is formed in later life. So Human beings are theory makers. Yeah, and that's what we do from the beginning. And the child, from the beginning, the child is making these stimulus response connections. You don't have memories of it, but it's in your bones. You feel that's the connection. So the same thing happens at any point in life where if I've never been on an airplane before, I'm going to be nervous. It's a new experience. It's unfamiliar. And, and then it goes great, and the plane lands. But there's been a connection made between being nervous and everything going great. So the next time I get on a plane, I can either say, it went great, I don't need to be nervous, or I can develop a fear of flying and think that I have to be really worried in order to make sure that plane lands. It can be a chronic situation where, for instance, in infancy, a baby has a depressed mother who struggles to respond, and so the baby feels like he's got to keep his mother alive. Well, right there, that's an omnipotent idea. It's not realistic, but the mother stays alive and the baby stays alive, so that gets lodged in experience. When we get to a toddler, toddlers are assertive. They're like drive personified, and they start having all kinds of sexual feelings and body feelings of excitement and arousal. That takes place in the context of their relationships. All these things that are the kid expressing wishes get responded to as aggression and defined that way, and the kid starts to think, forcing somebody to do something or dominating someone. That to the child feels like the only way to stay attached, even to stay alive. So that adds the element of sexual gratification onto the sadomasochism. And then you've got the package. With that package, you go forward into the next levels of development. You go forward into the school years and then adolescence when you can make things truly happen. Then you are set up for a pattern that can be lifelong. It may be drinking, it may be promiscuous sex, it may be m masturbating 10 times a day, rewriting your, your uh, dissertation 10 times and not being able to finish it. That is your solution to something. And you say, can you go through a day, one day, without indulging in that? And you'll see the fear. Oh. And you'll see the fear in them. Yeah. The real fear, and then they'll say, well, maybe, well, can I call you? Will you be there? Well, I'll, you know, but they're terrified because you're taking away the thing that's holding them together. It becomes a true neurological addiction as much as smoking. Sadomasochistic sexual practices, sadomasochistic relationships, sadomasochistic thinking stimulates the same brain centers and releases endogenous opioids as heroin and cocaine. So we're not only dealing with psychological habits, we're not only dealing with learned behaviors, we're also dealing with 
a psychophysiologic addiction. How does the patient take on the possibility of change? How does it become something that the patient actively seeks and desires? If you stop to think how important our basic attachment to other people is, if that has been laid down as the currency of attachment, you don't want to give that up. What's your alternative? It's really terrifying. Will I be all alone? Will I be abandoned? Will I have anybody to take care of me? <clears throat> Our teacher, Anna Freud, had a story she always told about how the person on her couch sobbing and crying about his mother at the end of the session would get up and put on his jacket and go out and run a bank. Nobody comes to treatment with only one way of doing things. Okay. The analyst or the therapist has to be alert from the very beginning, listening for when did the patient opt for this kind of solution? Where are the little sparks and kernels in that person's life of a different kind of solution? But eventually, just as in the treatment relationship, we are operating in a mutually enhancing mutually growth-promoting situation, then that becomes a model of the alternative. So that's a whole dimension that's brought right into the treatment. We talked about right there. Are they like sitting at my feet and saying, you know, oh, great one, what should I do? Right. Or are they telling me what to do? Or right. Are, can they begin a sort of mutual? And what are the anxieties about mutuality of that? So all the tasks there are about relationships in the therapeutic. <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that's hard about doing therapy is that everybody has started off growing up with what I call movie psychiatry, the dramatic aha moment. And sometimes the literature, unfortunately, colludes with that unrealistic idea of it that the brilliant therapist is going to put everything together and make an interpretation, and the patient will have a cathartic experience and say, thank you, doctor, and walk out the door cured. Well, it's, <laughs> it's much more mundane than that. It's, it's work. It's hard daily work. Yeah.